<laughs> okay, here we go. All right. I paid everyone to do that, so they think you guys were doing great. Uh, let's pray. Let's get in the Word. Father, thank you this morning for who you are. God, I want to thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. I want to thank you that you cared so much that you would send Jesus to die. That he came in the flesh. God, that you came in Christ in the flesh. Father, thank you for that gift. And I pray today as I speak that, God, you would give me clarity and that you would give everyone here the ability to hear the word of God and to hear truth. Jesus, anything that would try to distract our hearts and minds, would you bind it up right now, Lord, and take authority over it. That we could hear clearly what you're doing and saying. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, we're going to talk about... So here's what we've been doing. For those of you that maybe missed a couple Sundays, we're going from the the throne of God to the manger. We're going backwards through the month of December. Jesus was the first message. He's on the throne. What's he doing right now? What does he look like? What's what's his uh, position? And then we went to the tomb and the cross... And now we're going to go to Jesus, the Son of Man, His manhood, how He came in the flesh. And then next weekend, you can only guess what we're going to talk about, the manger. I don't want to leave Jesus in our hearts and minds as the little baby in the manger, because I've said before, people are good with that. They're okay with Jesus in the manger. But He grew up and became a man. And He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. He has authority. He's not a little baby anymore. And so we're going to, I want us to worship God correctly and rightly. I want us to worship Jesus rightly, who he really is, not who we think he is in our minds, but what scripture says that he is right now. So getting into the word, here we go. John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing uh, was made uh, that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. Now look at Matthew 1, verse 21, real quick. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So here's what we have to understand. In the beginning, John takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, Jesus was the framer of the world. Nothing was made without him. And he spoke, and there was light. So Jesus, this little baby in the manger, is actually the framer of the entire world and the universe. And when he spoke, bam, stuff happened. And John's trying to paint the picture that we're talking about the uncreated God that came in the flesh so that we could have what? Nearness to him. Not so that he could be in the distance watching, but so that God would be with us in life. I mean, you know, right now we need him with us in this world. I mean, Connecticut, that's unbelievable. And all it is is pure evil. And, we, and our hearts want to break, and they should. And, but the problem is our hearts also become troubled. And Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because he overcame the world. He's overcome that system. And someday he'll return again, not as a baby, but as the awesome son of God. And no one will be able to withstand him. No one or nothing. He is the uncreated Genesis 1 God who came in the flesh. It's unbelievable to me that Jesus, the creator of it all, was born of a virgin. And people, I said it last week, people say, oh, there's no way that that's impossible. A virgin can't have a baby. How many know that's impossible? Raise your hand if you think that's impossible. Good. Some of you aren't sure. (laughs) Study health. Go to, you know, figure it out. (laughs) Listen, Jesus 
came in the flesh through a virgin, and it is impossible, but our God is not an impossible. He's the God who can do anything. He's not bound by human nature or by our flesh. He doesn't live within the constraints that we live in. And Jesus came and was born and became in the flesh God. 100% man, 100% human. Isn't that unbelievable? That God would love us so much and take responsibility over us that he would send his son to die for us. That should make us, that should be the end of the sermon. We should be done. That should make us happy and we should all go home and smile more and treat people better. Amen. Amen. You guys having problems in marriage? We'll work that out. <laughs> Romans 12, 21. Listen to this one verse. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The problem isn't that there's not enough Christians in the world. The problem is there's not enough Christians doing good. We've kind of, uh, in the body, we've kind of taken on, not the whole body, but parts of America, we've kind of taken on this, we're going to dance with the world a little bit. We're going to cuddle up to darkness and call it grace. Grace. And Jesus said he is the light of the world. He came to be light in a dark place. And then he said to us, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. The problem is most of us cuddle so close to the world in darkness that the world can't see that we're really lights because they can't tell. And John came, the Bible says, to be a witness. Watch this. He came to pave the way for Jesus to come. And I want to say something. He was a forerunner of the Savior. He was going, he's coming, get ready. Prepare yourselves. Now you and I are called to be, if you will, forerunners for Jesus because he's coming again a second time. He is returning to the earth. And you and I are called to live a life that paves the way for him. I'm not talking about religiosity and wearing Christian t-shirts. I mean, that's okay. How many know it's okay to wear some Christian t-shirts? But I'm talking about living a life where we see Jesus, where people see kindness and goodness pouring out of us, not just religion, but Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world shining in our lives. Sometimes that means we have to raise a standard that is uncomfortable in a dark world, right? It's not like, uh, it, it's not really cool to be holy anymore or to even pursue holiness. Why? Because you're mocked. But Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. By the way, I live inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that means you've overcome the world too. So we live in his grace and his power and his anointing, and we overcome the world. I'm not saying, and Jesus never, I love Jesus because he didn't lie to us. He didn't say, if you give your life to me, it's going to be all perfect. He never said that, did he? Matter of fact, he said, some of you are going to get martyred for me. Thank you. But it'll be worth it all. And Jesus came in the flesh. And he grew up, and there's not much said about him in his early years. And then he became a man, and we read about him, casting out demons, raising the dead setting people free, healing people. Everywhere he went, the Bible says Jesus went about doing what? Good. He just went around doing good. And that's what we need in our day. We need the body of Christ, believers, to stand up and say, we're going to live for Jesus and do what's right and do what's good. We're going to love the lost. Some of us, though, we think that what Christianity is, is that we just bag on the people that don't know God and come against the people that don't know Jesus. And we kind of criticize them that somehow that makes us look more holy. I say to you, it makes us look terrible. What we do is we live holy and we love people so that they go, there's something about that person and I can't figure it out. And then when they ask, we say, it's the goodness of God. It's the mercy of God. Jesus lives in my heart. I've been forgiven much, so I love much. Amen? Amen. This Christmas season, we need to do that. How many know sometimes in the mall, it's a little tough to be loving right now? <laughs> Long lines. A lady jumped in front of me the other day at the mall, cut right in front of me. She just came right in. She just had her purse. And she, just, she just 
had her thing and she walked right in and I, and, and I had the moment to go, what are you doing? That's what I wanted to say. So you know what I said? Nothing. My dad always said, if you can't say something good. So I just folded my arms and she turned around. All you. But there needs to be kindness in our life so the world sees Jesus in us. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. I love this story because it cracks me up. This is the only real part we see about Jesus as a teenager, like a 12-year-old. I wish there was more, but I mean, you know, sometimes those teenage years, we just kind of want to forget about them. Amen. Those of you that have a teenager say? Amen. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody had to throw an extra one in there. Struggling. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. This is talking about Jesus' parents. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And he, when he was 12 years old, and they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they'd finished those days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. They were in a group, a big group. I mean, you know that you'd have to be in a decent-sized group to forget your kid. But supposing him to have been in their company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at, uh, at his understanding and answers. So they saw him. They were amazed. His mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father, and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not under understand the statement which he spoke. How would it be to raise God? I mean, you know, I read that through and thought, wow, that had to be an interesting time. First of all, he's born immaculately. So how do you raise God? Jesus, you're late. <laughs> no, I'm not. My timing's perfect. <laughs> Jesus, you think you know it all, don't you? Pretty much. You think you're God's gift, don't you? <laughs> I pretty much am. Could you imagine that? Just, wow, this 12-year-old. They're in the Winnebago on their trip. Place is filled with people. They go in, they do their thing. They load up the truck. They head to the next place. A day later, they go, where's Jesus? And they go everywhere that a 12-year-old might go. They go to the mall, skate park, arcade. Where's Jesus? And when they found him, there he was schooling and listening humbly to, his, to the leaders. And they were like, wow, this guy's amazing. And his mom walks up to him, Jesus, what have you done? I'm anxious. You know when mom's like, you know, you know that thing when they put their hand right here? I don't know about you, but that, I think my mom used to carry a gun because she would always go for here. <laughs> She would always do this, and I was like, what were you before you were my mother? <laughs> Watch this. And they were amazed at what came out of him. And she's kind of, kind of dealing with Jesus, and Jesus says, don't you know that I must be about what my father's doing? Twelve years old. My junior high group I had years and years ago, I didn't treat them like little kids. I treated them like adults. I said, if the devil can deceive you at 12, then Jesus can save you and you can know him at 12, at 11, at 10. And I must be about my, my father's. I had a friend who used to, to, to talk like this. He's just, I want to have a musting spirit. Because most of us have a lusting spirit. And I don't mean lusting like just, we, when we think of lust, we only think of women, men looking at women, 
women, women looking at men, right? We think that's lust. But did you know lust is far greater than that? Lust is a, is a desire for something that you can't really have. Or maybe you shouldn't have. Lust is setting your heart on something that is completely anti to, to the kingdom of God. And all of us have it. Look right here. Everyone just put your eyes on me. All of us have lust in our heart. The Bible says we have the pride of life. We lust in our eyes and we lust in our flesh. We all have it. You might be different than me. My, my little handle, that the, now if a woman's wearing a purse, and I've seen the women, they, they wear the purse now this way, right? Am I doing that right? It's kind of like strapped around. So basically, if, if you walked up and tried to take that purse, you grab them and the whole body comes. There are some of us that the enemy has little handles in our lives. That all he's got to do through pain, through sorrow, through traumatic experiences, through however, through just flesh, he just grabs that handle and gives us a tug. And that's when you and I have to learn how to resist and have a musting spirit for God instead of a lusting spirit. And Jesus grew up sinless and, and perfect. And he had a spirit that said, I must be. Listen, when we get saved, when Christ comes into our hearts, there's something about us that says we must be about the Father's business. You can't just go, oh, whatever, the world, whatever. How many of you watch those shows on TV, like commercials, where they have the little starving babies in Africa and stuff, and you cry a little bit? Huh. It's so sad. And then the next commercial comes on, and you're like, well, over with that. True compassion causes us to really do something about that. Instead of just a tear, we go, I need to do something. I must do something for God. I, I say to you that that's what we all need. We need the Spirit of God to come upon us and anoint us so we can be like Jesus that says, look, I'm not going to be distracted by the world and all of its stuff. I'm going to be a musting kind of Christian that, Lord, what today can I do? How can I live today? What can I say today? How can I treat that coworker that just drives me nuts? Anyone? Don't raise your hand because they might be in the room. <laughs> Jesus, come and be in me. Be with me. Help me. Because I have handles where the enemy, I don't know what your handle is. Alcohol, drugs, women, men, spending money just because it makes you feel good. I don't know what your thing is. My thing is this. The enemy just loves to come and just kind of get me irritated. Like, you know, the, the, he can parade a woman in front of me and I say, I've been married to my wife for 25 years, almost. We're close. No, yeah, that's good. Yeah, amen. It's been hard on her. Been... But, but I, want, I just want to be real for a minute because we've got to talk about this stuff. We don't talk about it in church, but yet it's happening. If the enemy parades a woman, I just go, I'm in love with my wife. See, you might have a snare, though, there where you just, oh, boy. Me, it's other things. It's irritation. It's getting a little too intense sometimes and getting a little angry. Not angry like I'm going to thrash somebody, but you know what I mean. You just start to react and respond out of a wrong spirit. And so when the enemy comes, I have to learn to resist. What did Jesus do when the enemy came? As in his manhood, and he was attacked by hell. The Bible says in Hebrews that he is our high priest who can sympathize with us in our weakness. You know what that means? Jesus was tempted in every way. He was hit by the enemy. He was hit by life. And so when we come to him to the throne of grace and pray, oh God, help me, he is not disconnected from how we feel because he's been there. And he says, oh, I know exactly what you mean. And when the enemy hit Jesus, what did he do? He resisted and he resisted with truth of the word of God. In his manhood, Jesus was hit by the enemy. And he responded with what? The word. And the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Isn't that powerful? I mean, wow. He showed us the word in action in everyday life, resisting temptation, resisting darkness. You and I have a responsibility to cry out to God and ask for help. How many know we can't do that by ourselves? We need the restraint and the power of the Holy Spirit.
I just told someone today, you know what the problem is? The problem isn't guns. In China, 20-some kids were attacked in school on the same day by what? Knives. So it's not a gun problem. You can't, you can't just make everything illegal because you, it's not going it, to... Listen, if somebody has evil in their heart, they're going to use this mic stand. The problem is the heart of man is desperately wicked. The Bible says that about us. And we need Jesus. We need morality. We need prayer and fasting and a church that's radical and stands up for for righteousness. That's what's going to turn the tide. It's not going to be government and more laws. It's going to be Jesus coming and revival happening and an awakening happening in our country. That's what it's going to take. Yeah? So we have to be willing, we have to be willing to be the ones that pay the price. Now we have to be like John the Baptist and we have to be forerunners and prepare the way for Jesus because he's coming when? Quickly and soon. And you and I have the responsibility to say, Jesus, help me. I know I'm a mess, Lord. Look, let's just, let's just deal with it. We're a mess. Matter of fact, I'm just going to say this. After service, out, out in the lobby, there's a table that says celebrate recovery on it. And it's for people with all kinds of troubles. It's not just drugs and alcohol. It's for fear and worry and anxiety and issues and uh, whatever your hang-up is. Why don't you just go ahead and just say, I need help. I'm going to go celebrate recovery instead of hide from recovery. Amen. Yeah? So just go to the table and say, I'm jacked up. <laughs> Some of you go, I, I don't want anyone to know that about me. We already know. <laughs> the only person you're fooling is yourself. Go do it. Sign up. Get healthy. Love Jesus. Get in the Word of God. I want to close with two verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Now we'll look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. This is the principle I'm talking about. Inside of every believer, there is a battle going on. Paul said, my spirit and my flesh are at war. (laughs) If you have warring in your spirit and your flesh, I want you to do something really cool. I want you just to, when church is over, you don't have to do it now. I just want you to go like this. Thank you, Jesus, that there's a war in me because that means you live inside of me. Because if there's no war inside of you, then we need to question if somebody's really living inside of you. If sin doesn't bother you, if you don't go, oh, every time you do that stupid thing you said you'd never do again, if there's not, ah, that ah is okay. That, that fighting and warring is good. Listen, it's, it's, uh, it's like the little, uh, I took, hold on, I took, I, I remember this from fifth grade, I have to go back. The little caterpillar goes into its cocoon and nothing's happening. It looks like nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden you see the little cocoon start to move. Listen, don't try to help them out of the cocoon. I've done that. They die. They die. They come out, they, they fight and they squirm and then they come out, watch this. Way different than when they went in. And it is the struggle, you guys. It is the struggle when we, by grace, through faith in Jesus, we struggle and resist sin like Jesus did, that we get wings. Now, don't go saying, Pastor Rick said, I'm going to get wings someday. Don't say that. You know what I mean. We, the beauty of the Lord shows up in our life. The resisting is good. Look here. The resisting is good for you. Don't let the, see, here's what the enemy does. Oh, you're not really a Christian. You're not saved. If you were really saved, you wouldn't struggle with fear. You wouldn't struggle with worry. You wouldn't struggle with alcohol. You wouldn't struggle with being angry if you were really saved. No, 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 no. The, you are saved. That's the problem. And the enemy's trying to talk you out of your salvation and just get you to lay down and, uh, and die. Instead, Remember Rocky, the first Rocky? 
not Rocky 27 or 26 or 25, <laughs> but Rocky, the first one. I love that movie. When he's running and exercising and comes up those stairs and he, why? The struggle is what made him Rocky. See, I don't have the body of Rocky. Do you know why? Because I don't struggle. Never. <laughs> Somebody asked me, do you want to go on a run? Caleb, our, 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 one of our youth guys, great guy, he asked me at least once a week, Pastor Rick, you want to go jogging with me this week? I said, well, how far are you running? He goes, I don't know, four or five miles. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> the only time I run is if somebody's chasing me. That's it. I move pretty slow. Uh, lifting weights for me is a dinner plate, a remote control. You know what I'm saying? But if I did struggle and go ahead and just put effort, guess what would happen? I would see results and change. You see, that nature that's inside of us, that sin nature, and that, that new nature, which is the Holy Spirit, there's going to be battle. We just have to deal with the fact that that's just the way it's going to be. But we resist sin when it comes. We don't warm up to it and call it grace. Oh, thank you for your grace, Lord. It's good. How many know that His grace still covers that? <laughs> But here's the problem. At some point, we probably ought to grow up to the point where we're not just offending the Lord every time he turns around, but we're actually having a lifestyle that says, Lord, I want you to be at home in my heart. I want you not to be contending with me all the time, even though he still is contending with me. Jesus, I want to be soft before you. I want to live for you. Amen? Resist it. And here's the last thing I'm going to leave you with. Just a, and this is stupid, okay? Write it down, though. We need to feed the must and deny the lust. Now listen, that, that, that's uh, kind of corny, but it's all I could come up with. <laughs> we need to feed the must and deny the lust. What does the Bible says? say? Whatever a man sows, he'll reap. Watch this. Whatever you put in the ground, drop a seed in and cover it. The Bible says whatever you do is going to grow up in your backyard. When I was, before I met Jesus, I used to go to sleep listening to Ozzy Osbourne and Scorpions and Judas Priest and all these terrible bands. And then I wondered why I woke up in the morning so angry. Do you know your spirit never sleeps? My, my little guy listens to the prayer room all night long. It's on his computer. It plays in his room. And I said to him the other day, I said, Aaron, do you know how cool it would have been if at 12 I would have been listening to this instead of what I was listening to? Because he's a cheerful little guy, except for when he has to be the shepherd and the player, the, the <laughs> disciple. Did you guys see that? Did you see him? Con <laughs> We're angry. We found Jesus. You know. I don't even know what I was talking about. I totally lost it. It's a poor kid. But do you see what I'm saying? It gets into our spirit. It gets into our minds. And whatever you sow in here, whatever you reap, I mean sow, is going to reap and you're, you're, it's going to happen in your life. How many of you are praying for crop failure right now? Lord, please let that die. His grace is good and he covers. But sometimes we do things and the Lord forgives us, but the consequence goes on and on and we have to deal with it. And sometimes the Lord just takes care of those consequences. But I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to have to wonder, how, is this going to hang on in my life? For, I, I just want to live righteous and do the best I can. And by the way, people say, well, that's works. And I go, well, well, we are called, the Bible says, to struggle. We're to resist. Of course it's works. I don't mean works to be saved. I mean works to make right decisions under righteousness. That, yeah, I have to make those decisions. The Holy Spirit's not a demon. He doesn't possess me and make me do things. I have to... I have to go, I'm going to live righteous and agree with your heart, Jesus, and agree with your word. And when I do, power's released and life comes. It's pretty simple. And, and, and so we want to stop pouring into this, to the ground the soil, bitterness, anger, fear, worry, whatever it is. And we want to start saying, Lord, I want in the soil of my heart, I want the word of God. I want your presence. And you're going to struggle, but the struggle is good. Amen? 
Jesus came in the flesh so that we could have victory and reign with him, he says, in life in Christ Jesus. How many of you want that? Oh, I want that. All day long and three times on Sunday, I want that. I want to live righteous. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much. First of all, that you don't condemn us. You understand the battle. Lord, I love the Psalms that says you understand our frames, that we're just made out of dust. You understand, Lord, that we're weak. You understand that, God. You're not condemning us. But, Lord, you've made a way through your son, Jesus. Father, you made a way. You released the Holy Spirit's power. And you gave us grace. And we're so thankful. Help us, Lord, to to take advantage of your riches and your glory. I want to just make a call quickly, just with every uh, head bowed and, and eye closed. Maybe you're in this place today and you don't know Jesus. He came in the flesh to die for you so that you could have eternal and abundant life. For God so loved you that He gave. He gave His Son. He so loves you that He wants relationship with you. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to be saved except for receive what Jesus has already done. I'm going to start on the left side of this building all the way to the side. If that's you and you want to say yes to Jesus today, would you just raise your hand up so I can acknowledge that? And I'm just going to move slowly through this place, so keep them up so I can see. Good. This is the day, man. Yeah, I see your hand. Great. Awesome. Anyone else? I'm coming about middle of the room now. Yes. Yeah, I see your hand. That's awesome. Yes, you. Yeah, I see your hand too. Way in the back. Good. Way over here. Yep, I see your hand. Praise the Lord. Yeah, if you're in this place and you're saying, man, I just want Jesus in my life. Do you know that he's already heard the cry of your heart? Would you just, where you're sitting, say, Jesus, come. Come into my heart say it. He knows what you need. Forgive me of sin. Lord, give me a relationship with you. I believe you died. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again and that you sit at the right hand of the Father. Just invite Jesus into your life and tell somebody before you leave this place. Just tell someone, I gave my heart to Jesus today. Lord, I want to pray for our our valley. Would, I, I just really felt led last night, you guys, to pray for just our valley and every Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching church. Can we just take a minute? You don't have to yell it out. Just under your breath, would you begin to pray for the churches that you know of in our area? And some of you go, I don't like that church. That's okay. You don't have to like that church. Pray for them, though. Father, today we come before you and we want to pray for every Bible-believing, Jesus-loving church. Lord, in this whole area, Father, we lift new life before you in Cornerstone, Bay City. Lord, we lift up to you, CPC. Lord, we lift up every church, God, that's in this area, that you would cause people, even in this moment right now, to come to Jesus. Holy Spirit, that you would visit those churches, that you would make them places that are hungry for you and going after you and building your kingdom. Lord, thank you that it's not about our churches and competition and all that stuff. Lord, thank you that it's about your kingdom advancing. That's what it's about. So Lord, we bless those churches. We speak life over those pastors. We speak your grace. And Lord, as East Bay Foursquare, we just say, Lord, we want to be intercessors and stand in the gap for all the churches in our area. Lord, bless them and cover them today in Jesus' name.